Hello and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to our night of radio plays, Mars is Heaven, The Apple Tree, and The Tom Keeler Murders, all from classic radio shows of the 1940s and 50s. This presentation is brought to you by the Timber Griffin Theater Company and the Early College of Arvada. The voices you'll be hearing tonight belong to the students of ECA with guest artist Paul Campbell of the Upstart Crow Theater Company. Alongside, cameos from our directing team, Kelly Bidstrup graham and Sam DeRossi. These live stream performances today, tomorrow, and Saturday, April 22nd, 23rd, and 24th of 2021, are open to the public with a suggested donation of $10 that can be made at ecarvada.booktix.com. The link to make your donation by purchasing a ticket will be in the description box below. You can also click the link in the description to view our virtual program and see which actor is voicing which characters, who worked behind the scenes, and the amazing work we did this year, and get a sneak peek into our plans for next year. Your generosity will help us as we rebuild our theater program post-COVID in the fall. First up this evening is Mars is Heaven, originally airing May 8th of 1955 on the radio show X-1. Be sure to give your praise and applause in the chat. Now, enjoy. Countdown for blast off. X minus five, minus four, minus three, minus two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company presents X minus one. Tonight's story, Mars is Heaven. When the first space rocket lands on Mars, what will we find? Only the ruins of a dead and deserted planet? Or will there be life, intelligent life in some strange form that we can only imagine? Will we be welcomed with open, with open arms? Or will the Martians treat us as invaders? Only one thing is certain. Some day a giant metal ship will take off from the Earth to travel through the black velocities, the silent gulfs of space, to descend at last into the darkness of the upper Martian atmosphere. And on that day, Man will finally know the answers. The day that we at first land on Mars. Now hear this. Now hear this. Approaching critical deceleration. Fasten gravity suits and stand by to land. There it is. We've intersected the course vector, sir. All right, Mr. Lustig. Over to manual control. Aye, sir. Masters, sound general quarters. Aye, sir. Mr. Lustig, what do you make of the terrain? There seems to be a heavy ground mist, Captain. We won't be able to use the infrared lights. Then we'll have to come in on radar. Isn't that a little risky, sir? Landing in the dark. I'd rather run the danger of a blind landing, Lieutenant, than come in without cover of darkness. Remember, we don't know what kind of reception is waiting for us down there. Airspeed 500. Altitude now 4,000. Bridge to engine room. Stand by for deceleration. Fire forward tubes one and three. Steady as she goes, Mr. Lustig. As she goes, sir. Airspeed 100. Altitude 1000. Radar indicates the level stretch dead ahead, sir. Skids down. Skids checked. Altitude 500. Four, three fifty, three. Up a point now. All right. Set her down. Woo! Yeah! yeah. Oh, woo! 
Cut the power, masters. Pipe battle stations. Aye, sir. All secure, sir. Well, gentlemen, gentlemen, we're now on Mars. April 20th, 1987. 4.33 Greenwich time. Enter that in the log, masters. Aye, sir. Well, gentlemen, it's less than two hours till dawn. As soon as it's light, we'll send out a landing party. Masters, give me an all-over hookup. We're all set, Captain. Now hear this. All right, men. The smoking lamp is lit. Well, we're on Mars. The first man shipped from Earth to land here. We don't know what we're going to find or what dangers we may face. We're 17 men on an alien world. It's up to us whether we ever get home again. The next few hours should tell the story, and I want instant obedience to all commands. I'll court-martial the first man who doesn't jump to what he's ordered. And one other thing. We may be on Mars, but this is still a United States naval vessel. Officers will conduct a personal and weapons inspection in one hour. That's all. An inspection, Captain, now? Mr. Lustig, we've got an hour and a half to sweat out before we find out what's outside that airlock. I'd rather have a man worried about his stripes than about what's waiting outside on Mars. Now hear this. Landing party report, forward airlock. Captain Black, Lieutenant Kingston, Lieutenant Lustig, Dr. Horst report immediately to forward airlock. Now landing time, minus five. Well, they're paging us. You ready, Dr. Horst? Yes, Mr. Lustig. As ready as I'll ever be. Come on, let's get in the lock. Kingston, Lustig, and Mr. Horst reporting in the airlock. Very well, sir. Captain will join you. Four minutes to go. I wish the captain would get here. What difference does it make? I just want to get it over with, that's all. Anybody got a cigarette? Yeah. I think you're smoking too much, Latan Lustig. Are you nervous? Lay off, will you, Horst? I wonder what's hidden outside underneath that ground mist. I've been giving it some thought. It'd be very interesting to find out. Very unusual place, Mars. Why? It has an atmosphere. A wonderful thing, an atmosphere. Where you find one, you, uh, find life. You mean Martians? What do you think they'll look like? Who knows? Intelligent life can take many forms. You mean they have green skin and eyes on stalks or something? The comic book conception is possible, of course. Or they've developed far beyond us. Perhaps they have science that can prove weapons far more dangerous than their atomic missiles. You think we might have to fight our way out? After all, we are invaders. Now hear this. Landing time, minus two. All right, all right, we heard this. You know what I'd like to find outside that airlock? Good old Illinois. You ever been there, Lustig? Uh, only Chicago. You ought to see my hometown. Green lawns, big white houses. Sounds like my hometown. My grandmother used to have one of those iron deer on the lawn. Every Halloween, we'd paint it another color. One time, we painted it black and white like a Holstein cow. Where does your family live, Dr. Horst? I have no family. When I was a child, they were gassed to death in, doc in the Doc Cow Conservation Camp. Tough. No, it has its advantages. I have no ties to Earth. Nothing to lose now. Imagine I'm the only one on board who's free to enjoy our present peculiar position. All right, Masters. You can button it up now. Aye, sir. Well, gentlemen, check your sidearms. In one minute, we'll be the first men to set foot on Mars. Quite an honor, eh? As long as the medals are not warded posthumously. Still uneasy, Dr. Horst? Captain...
Mark, I've been out in Uzi ever since I can remember. On, on, on Earth and on Mars. Well, 30 seconds. Give me the intercom phone, Lustig. Yes, sir. Masters. Hi, sir. Battle stations are to be manned until we return. If we're not back in two hours, I want no rescue party sent out. Blast off and save the ship. You understand? Aye, uh, sir. All right. Five seconds. Four. Three. Two. One. Lustig, open the outer airlock. Aye, sir. It's, it's fresh air. Let's go. All right, now. Take it easy. It's too dark to move fast. Quiet, isn't it? Not even a wind. Can't see anything through this ground mist. Quiet. You don't know what's out here. All right, come on. What the? Quiet. Captain, I could swear that that, that sounds like a rooster. I don't hear it anymore. Very homely. Oh, unlikely sound. A rooster crowing on Mars. Kingston. Uh, aye, sir. Set that machine gun 25 yards to the flank. We'll stay here till the ground mist lifts. Aye, sir. What do you make of the ground, Horst? Grass. Plain grass. You can see some large foliage where the mist slid down. What the? Kingston, hold your fire, you fool. I hit it, Captain. What? Some kind of wild animal. I hit it. I can see the traces, but it's still standing. Come on, Horst. Doctor, where are you? Up ahead. Admiring the wild animal. Careful, Horst. Wait for us. Don't worry, Captain. <laughs> it's an iron deer, a lawn ornament. Well, that... that's impossible. It's hollow. Interesting, isn't it? Whitewashed Victorian iron deer sitting on a, on a lawn in the middle of Mars. I don't understand. Look around. The mist lifting. Hey, Captain, look there. It's a house. A regular old-fashioned house. But, sir, on Mars? Good lord, I haven't seen the carved scrolls and gingerbread like that in years. Look at that porch swing. The geraniums. There! I told you it was a rooster, Captain! Give me the glasses, Lustig. I want to take a look at that front, front window. Well, there's an upright piano. Some sheet music on it. Lustig, it's beautiful Ohio. It can't be, sir. Horst, do you think that civilization of two planets could be identical? I don't know. That specific style of geranium is only 50 years old on Earth. Is it logical that they should develop in Mars? How about that porch wing? And that piano? And beautiful Ohio? Why, it's impossible. Captain Black, this looks like my, the town I was born in. Well, it... It looks like my hometown, too. I thought of something, sir. It's the only solution. Maybe we're not the first ship to reach Mars from Earth. Don't be ridiculous, Lustig. Well, how else can you explain it? Suppose some scientists got together, they, they, they invented some spaceship and planted a colony here. That's the only answer. That's impossible, Lustig. Men's space travel. It couldn't be secret. Do you have any idea what ships cost? Well, industrialized power is needed. No, there's got to be some logical reason. I think perhaps you might find out, Captain. The light went on in the house. Kingston, cover that door with the machine gun. Aye, sir. Come on, Horst. We're going to ring that doorbell. There's got to be a scientific answer to all this. 
There's something moving in there. Stand back, Horst. Give me a clear shot. You sure a bullet can stop a Martian? Steady now. Can I help you? I... Well, we... If, if you're selling anything, it's it's much too early. No, no. Wait just a minute. What town is this? Uh, well, what do you mean? Are, are you census takers? No, no, we're strangers here. We want to know how this town got here. Is, is this a game? No, no, it's not a game. We're from Earth. From where? From Earth. Do you mean out of the ground? Are you sure you're feeling well? Madam, we came in a flying spaceship across space. We're from the third planet Earth. This is Mars. Now, do you understand? Mars. You go away now, you hear. I'll call my husband from upstairs. He'll chase you. Go on. But this is Mars, isn't it? This is Great Lake Wisconsin, the United States of America, bounded on the east by the Atlantic and on the west by Pacific. Now go away now. Goodbye. Horst, do you suppose it's really possible? I've got to find out more about this. You. I'll call my husband. Now go away. You've got to tell me one thing first. What year is this? Year? 1928, of course. For goodness sake. You hear that, Horst? And we know it's 1987. And we know this is Mars. Horst. Is it possible that we got fouled up, made some tremendous blunder and circled around and landed back on Earth? In 1928? Well, maybe some switch in time or dimension. Could we have shifted somehow, gone backward in time? Oh, Horst, this won't hold water. It's not logical. We, we checked every mile. We went past the moon and out into space, where we're on Mars, Lustig, out at point. Kingston, in the rear. Keep that gun at half load. Aye, sir. Horst, there's got to be some cold, logical solution. Captain! What? The, the house down the street. The white, the white one with the green shutters. Lustig, what's the matter? I never, I never thought I'd thank God! Lustig, Lustig, come back here. He's running for that house. That crazy fool. After him, quick. Lustwick, stop. Calm down off that porch. Grandpa, Grandpa, Grandma. Lustig, what the devil do you think you're doing? Albert! <laughs> Grandpa, Grandpa, it is you. Lustig, what is going on here? Albert. It's been so many years. How you've grown, boy! Oh, it's so good to see you. Lieutenant Lustig. Oh. Captain. Grandma, I want you to meet my friends. This is Captain Black. Captain, I want you to meet my grandfolks. Well, howdy. Any old friend of Albert's, he's a friend of ours. How long have you been here, Grandma? Oh, a good many years. <laughs> Ever since we died. <laughs> Ever since you what? Yes, sir. They've been dead 30 years. What? Oh, now don't you trouble yourself. It's all right. We're alive again. That's all. You mean to tell me that Mars is heaven? Oh, nonsense, no. All we know is we're alive again. And who are we to question God's infinite ways? Lustig, we're going back to the ship. Captain, I, I want to talk to my grandfolks. Lieutenant Lustig, I don't like any part of this. You'll come back with us if I have to club you and carry you. Aye, sir. Now, let's go. Heaven only knows what they've run up against back at the ship. Mm. Uh. <laughs> uh. <laughs> mm. Woohoo!
Woohoo! Orst, look at that crowd around the ship. Looks like we're being welcomed with a celebration, Captain. Celebration? They've abandoned ship. Every port is open. No guard set. You. You masters. Ah, oh, hey, hiya, Captain. Meet my old dad. Dad, that's Captain Black. He's not bad a guy for an officer. Kingston! What, sir? Bring that band back. Use force if you have to. Aye, aye. Oh, if, excuse me, sir. That's my Uncle George. Kingston! I'll be right back, Captain. Uncle George! Uncle George! What the devil is going on here? Don't you understand, sir? They've all found friends and relatives. They're all here. You're right, Captain. I found them. The whole crew's out of the crowd. Well, I gave orders. Definite orders. You don't understand, Captain. I understand mutiny. I don't care how many relatives show up. All have discipline. John! Johnny! Johnny, you old son of a gun! It's you. Edward! Yes! It can't be! Oh, of course it is! Johnny! Johnny, you old! <laughs> Ed! Ed! Dr. Horst, this is my brother Edward. How do you do? Hello, sir. It's wonderful to see you, Edward. Look, I've got to get back to my ship. Johnny, wait! I almost forgot! Mom's waiting at home! Mom? Yeah, and Dad, too! Mom and Dad are alive? Then... Then you're real, Ed? Well, of course! Don't I feel ra real? How's that, huh? Why, Ed. Ed! We've got lunch for you, Johnny. Mom's making corn fritters. Dr. Horst, have you found anybody? Oh, no, Captain. I have nobody. Then you come on home with me. Right, Ed? Well, uh, sure! Horst. Horst, you wouldn't believe it. But it's been 35 years since I've had Mom's corn fritters. Why, George, 35 years. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and there's plenty more in the kitchen, so don't hold back, Johnny. You too, Dr. Horse. Well, Johnny, you're still in the Navy, huh? That's right, Dad. I'm in command of the ship. We're a whole Navy family, Dr. Horst. All three of our boys in the service. Ed was the best pilot in Pacific, till. What did happen, Ed? What's the difference? I'm here now. Yeah, but... You know, it's almost perfect. All we're missing is your brother, Will. Then the whole family could be together. That won't be long, Mom. Will's in charge of the XR-54, the next rocket coming out to Mars. Well, little Will. When does he leave, Johnny? Well, the takeoff's scheduled for September. Uh-huh. But it depends on what we report. Oh. Oh, yeah? There's no question about that now, huh? <laughs> <laughs> no! Christmas together again. That'll be something. Ah, uh, sure will. Yes, sirree. Well, I think this calls for a celebration. How about... No, uh, just a little of the old dandelion wine, eh, Johnny? Father, now don't you go giving Johnny too much wine. <laughs> <laughs> He's a big boy now, Mother. Yes, sir. Isn't everything just fine? Just fine. Oh, I'll be melancholy, too. <laughs> <laughs> Play that one again, will you, Ed? Oh, sure. Well, Dr. Horst, what are you doing sitting over here alone? What do you think of my little family? Very nice. You know, I can't understand why you didn't find any folks here, Dr. Horst. It's such a shame everybody else is so happy. Well, I remember my family, Mrs. Black. All I know is they're a gas at Dachau during the Second World War. When I was liberated, I was in delirium for three months. I cannot remember anything before then. A psychiatric phenomenon. Oh, that's terrible. Isn't there anything anybody can do? Mm, I don't want to remember. I haven't had a pleasant life. I prefer to be free of emotional entanglements. 
They interfere with my scientific approach. I'm sorry, Dr. Horst. What? Oh, I'll get it. That's our ring. Long and three shorts. I remember that. Well, maybe we better call it a night. You must be getting tired, Johnny. I better be going back to the ship. Now you understand us. You stay the night. We insist. I just couldn't rest thinking of you all alone on that ship. I'll be all right. Well, good night. Oh, oh, wait a minute, Dr. Horst. That phone message was for you. Me? Yes, that right. That's right. A message from Anna. Anna? I don't. Well, she must be an old friend. Isn't that nice? I don't. You sure it's for me? I don't remember any Anna. Well, she asked if you were better. Perhaps she's someone who you knew at Dachau. Anna. She said she's coming over here the first thing in the morning, so you have to stay over. Yes, but... Well, that settles it. You stay here, Horst. You can bunk with me in my old room. Oh, uh, yeah, but, Johnny, we, we thought you'd be, like, to be with Edward. So you could talk the way you used to. Well, we can't put Dr. Horst on the daybed. I think we'd better share the room tonight. We've plenty of time for talking, Ed. Yes, I guess so. I suppose I better drop back to the ship. You know, Ed. Security check. But why do you have to do that here? I... I don't know, Mom. There's no good reason, I guess. Suppose we skip it tonight. Well, good night, everyone. Oh, it's good to have you home, Johnny. It's good to be home, Mom. Captain Black, you asleep? No, no. I've been thinking about what we were expecting. <laughs> Green-skinned Martians. When all the time it was only Mom and Dad and Edward waiting. It's funny what tricks your imagination can play on you. Well, I guess Mars is heaven horsed. You know, I've been thinking about Martians too, Captain. Just suppose, suppose they were Martians and they saw us land. Suppose they thought of us invaders. What would be the best weapon they could use against our atomic bombs, huh? I don't see what you're getting at. They'd want to disarm us us first, huh? To wipe out submission, make us feel at home. Suppose these houses are real. Suppose the people are just images stolen from our memories by Martians, created for us by, by telepathically hypnotism. Huh. hypnotism. That's the craziest theory I've ever heard. Maybe that's why there's no one for me. Because of all my life, there's no happy me memory, no loved, real loved person, not even my mother. I don't remember her. Only piles of rotten corpses at Dachau. There's no happy motion for these people to, to, to recreate. How about that phone call? Aunt Anna. Yes, it's Anna. I didn't remember who she was, but I do now. I just remembered. When I was free from Dachau, sick, delirious, I raved about a wonderful, kind nurse named Anna who took care of me. Well, there you are. It's logical she's coming to see you tomorrow. But there is no Anna. I've been nursed by a what? man. And it was only a dream. There's only one way they could have learned about her. By reading my subconscious mind. That's impossible, Horst. Why? A whole crew is thinking of home. Suppose the Martians read our minds. Yes, but if there are Martians... If they are, they have us separated. Each man in a different house, sleeping, trusting, no one at the guns. I left my pistol downstairs. Do you think there's something, something to this, Horst? The perfect trap, Captain. Who would expect his own mother, his grandparents? How easy! Just a knife in the heart of each sleeping man. That's impossible, Horst. But we've got to get back to the ship. Listen, the crickets have stopped. Come on. We have 
we don't know when they'll change back to to whatever they really are. Careful. Where are you going, John? Ed, we uh, we wanted a drink of water. That's that's all, Ed. You're not thirsty, John. You don't want a drink. Look out! You don't want a drink! His face! It's changing! He's a Martian! Run, Horst! Run! You can't get away, John! This way, Horst! Horst, where are you? Ah! Hello. Hello, Earth. Can you hear me, Earth? This is Captain John Black, the XR-53, calling from Mars. I've locked myself in the ship, but they've crippled it. I can't take off or fire the guns, and they're coming for me now, the Martians. I'm all alone here. All the rest are dead. Kingston, Lustig, Dr. Horst. Poor Horst. He didn't even reach the door. Listen, listen, they're trying to break through the hall. Edward, and Mom, and Dad, and all the folks. But they're changing now. They're melting and changing back into... They're Martians. Can you understand? They're Martians, not men. They made us think that Mars was heaven, and we fell into the trap. Can you hear me, Earth? You've got to stop the next rocket. Listen, tell my brother Will not to come. They'll trap them too. They'll kill them all. Hello, hello. Can you hear me, Earth? This is John Black on Mars. Hello, Earth. This is John Black on Mars. Hello, Earth. Hello, Earth. Hello, Earth. Tonight, X-1 was brought to you by the science fiction classic, Mars is Heaven. Written by Ray Bradbury and adapted for radio by Ernest Canoy. X minus one. Fabulous job. Give them your praise and applause in the chat. All these radio play scripts are almost identical to how they aired at the time. Sponsors and transitions have changed, but we've kept the ads and the original introductions to really bring you back the nostalgia of this time. Don't forget that your donations help us to rebuild our music and theater programs post-COVID. The suggested donation for tonight's performance is $10, but any amount is welcome. Purchase your donation ticket at ecrvada.booktix.com. All links to the, are in the video description along with our virtual program. Next up, we have a touching play called The Apple Tree, which originally aired September 6th, 1946 at the Mercury Theater. Good evening. This is Orson Welles, your producer and a special series of broadcasts presented by the makers of A&W Root Beer. The Mercury Summer Theater of the Air. Tonight and every Friday night, A&W Root Beer presents you with a front row seat in America's favorite summer theater. So while America's fav famous producer, writer, director Orson Welles entertains you, pour yourself a tall frosted glass of A&W Root Beer and enjoy at the same time great entertainment in this truly great theater. And now, Mr. Wells. Tonight, the Mercury brings you one of the loveliest of all love stories. It's by John Galsworthy, and it's called The Apple Tree.
It was Stella's and my silver wedding anniversary. We'd motored to Torquay, where we first met, to celebrate. Stella had suggested that we take a lunch and drive out on the moor. It'd be so lovely there, Frank, and quite warm in the sun. I can do some sketching while you read. We drove several miles and stopped on a high hill with a view into the deep valley beyond. Stella wandered off somewhere to sketch and I stretched out in the sun and watched the sky and longed for I knew not what. There was no reason I should be unhappy or even mildly disturbed. My life had been pleasant, my marriage quite successful, but as I lay there, it seemed to me that there was something missing, something that had nothing to do with pleasant lives or successful marriages. The familiar words of Hippoly Hippolytus echoed in my mind. The apple tree, the apple tree, the singing and the gold, the apple tree. And then, quite suddenly, I remembered. I'd been here before, years before. I'd stood on this self-same hill. I knew the valley into which I looked, that ribbon of road and the old well behind. Life is moments of sheer beauty, of unbidden flying rapture that they last no longer than the span of a cloud's flight over the sun. I'd stumbled on just such a moment. In my own life, I'd stumbled on a buried memory of wild, sweet time. It was after my first year in college. A friend of mine, Robert Garton, and I were making a walking tour of the country around Torquay, but my knee, which had been injured in a football game the year before, was giving me trouble. I knew I'd have to give up the tour. We were looking for a farmhouse somewhere where we could put up until I got better. I don't think you want to walk much further, Frank. Why don't I go ahead and reconnoiter? Oh, I won't need to. Here's someone coming. It was a girl. The wind blew her crude li little skirt against her legs and lifted her battered tam o -shanter. It was clear she was a country girl. Her shoes were split, her hands were rough and brown, and her hair waved untidily across her forehead. But her lashes were long and dark, and her great eyes were wonder, dewy as if opened for the first time that day. Hello. Could you tell us if there's a farm near here where we could spend the night? My friend's getting pretty lame. Well, there's our farm, sir. Oh, could you put us up? I'm sure my aunt would be glad to. If you'd like, I'll show you the way. We appreciate it very much. It's not very far, just down the valley, right through the apple orchard, and we're there. Just through a narrow wood, we came on the farm, a long, low, stone-built house with casement windows. In the farmyard were pigs and fools and an old mare were straying about, and in front, an orchard of apple trees, just breaking into flower. A woman stood by the door, watched as we approached. This is Mrs. Narco, Mount. We met your niece on the road. She said she, she thought you might put us up. I can, if you don't mind one room. Megan, get the spare room ready and a bowl of cream. The gentleman we will, will be wanting tea, I expect. Thank you, Mrs. Narco. By the way, I, we haven't been introduced. No, sir. This is Robert Garton. I'm Frank Ashurst. How do you do, sir? Hello. What's your name? Megan David. Are you a Devonshire girl? Oh, no, sir. I'm from Wales. You're very young, aren't you? Eighteen, sir. Yeah. How many of you live here? Oh, there's my aunt, the two nephews, the boy as you saw as you came. Nick and Rick, they're called. My hired man. Quite a family. Yes, sir. If there's anything else you want, you'll call. All right, thank you. Pretty thing, isn't she? Huh? Pretty. She's like a flower. Like a wild flower that you come on unexpectedly in the woods. Hmm. A bit poetic for me, but I see your point. I say, Frank, your knee is pretty bad. Yeah. What do you say I leave you here for a couple of days? Well, it does hurt like the devil. What about you? Well, I have to get back to London, but I can get the train from Torquay. That is, if you don't mind being left alone. 
As a matter of fact, I shall like it. Nothing to do but dream and watch spring on a farm. I've always wanted to do that. Well, good luck to you, then. Look me up when you get to London. And uh, be careful of the wildflowers. It was good to be left alone. I think they were glad to have me. Megan and her aunt worried about my lameness, as if I'd been one of the family. From the very first, I felt that Megan liked me. She performed little kindnesses for me that weren't part of her duties. As the days went by, I began to expect them. When I awoke in the morning, the thought of her made me anxious to be up and downstairs. Even if I didn't talk with her, I liked to be near her where I could hear her singing at her work. One day, I was down by the big apple tree. The two little boys, Nick and Rick, were playing there by the pool. <laughs> Watch out, Rick. The bug will get you. Boggle? <laughs> what do you mean by the boggle, Rick? Oh, the boggle sits there on the stone, right by the apple tree. Oh, and what does he look like? Well, I don't know. I've never seen it. Megan says he sits there. Megan's the beard of him. Oh? But she's not a fear of you. She says a prayer for you. How do you know that, you little rascal? Well, when I was asleep, she said, God bless us all, and Mr. Ashes. I heard her whispering. You're a little ruffian to tell you to tell what you hear when you're not meant to hear it. You see, Rick, I told you not to tell him. Nick, Rick, come here, both of you. Here they are, Megan. I've been looking you all over for you for the last. <laughs> go in the house at once. Auntie wants you. Now go on with you. Now Nick told him about the boggle. Go on now. No more nonsense out of you. <laughs> <laughs> Children are s <laughs> Children are silly sometimes. Oh, I don't think so. They're often more sensible than grown-ups. Tell me, Megan, what's this boggle they're talking about? He brings bad things. There's boggles in the rock. They're men who lived long ago. There's one that comes here and sits on that rock. I shall come down one night and sit on the rock then and have a talk with him. Oh, please don't. Something will happen to you. Well, does it matter if anything happened to me, Megan? Would it disturb you a lot? Well, I, I dare say I shan't see him because I suppose I shall be off pretty soon. Oh, no. Would you like me to stay? Yes, very much. Well, then I will stay. And tonight, Megan, I will... I'm going to say a prayer for you. You're laughing at me. You're laughing at all of us. That's not true, Megan. Really, that's not true. Oh. I... Uh... Wait, Megan, your hair. Your hair, it's caught in the apple blossoms. Don't move, Megan, don't move. Uh, you're, you're beautiful with those clusters of pink blossoms in your hair. Megan. Oh. You're so very, very sweet, Megan. You are too. Megan, come here tonight. The big apple tree. After they've gone to bed, Megan, promise. I promise. For a long time after Megan had fled away through the orchard, I stood there, under the apple tree. This was the beginning of what? She was so lovely, so unutterably lovely and untouched. I felt somehow as if I'd beheld a miracle, and it had transformed me. I walked on toward the wild meadow. Jim, the hired man, was out there. Good evening to you, Mr. Ashurst. Good evening, Jim. Tis brave other for the grass. They told me you've seen the boggle. Uh, have you seen it too? Is that right? Well, for in my mind, it was there this evening. Little I thought. Ask Megan if she was there. She seen him. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, she's sensitive. She she feels everything. She's very loving-hearted. Loving-hearted. Aye. Yes, that was it. What was I to do about this girl who loved me so and whom I loved? I walked for a long time in the orchard. I broke off a spray from a crab apple tree. The buds were like Megan, shell-like, rose pink, wild and fresh, and the opening flowers white and wild and touching.
Ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to our Mercury production of John Galsworthy's great love story, The Apple Tree. Now, before we bring you the final act of The Apple Tree, here's Jimmy Wallington, who is the glint of an old grad in his eyes. He thinks of the coming football season. Ah, yes, Orson. Tomorrow and next Saturday, the old Pickens season, season swings into action. Those first really post-war 11s gallop out on the field. And that reminds me, of course, of blended, splendid a w root beer. For what is truly great root beer but a team. A blend of never less than 33 fine roots, each in itself an All-American for flavor and quality. Yes, and what is finer than to have the team right with you in a tall foam-capped glass as you sit by your radio and listen to the referee's whistle start the Saturday Get on Battles? Yes, friends, you'll find me tomorrow right by my radio listening to a football game. And right beside me where I can enjoy that perfect flavor, not too heavy, not too light, but clean, fresh, sparkling, will be a good supply of blended, splendid a w root beer. And say, incidentally, friends, if you occasionally can't get all the a w root beer you wish, Please keep on asking your dealer for it. We're doing our best to get your share of blended, splendid a and root beer. And now, part two of Orson Welles' Mercury production of the famous love story by John Galsworthy, The Apple Tree. She kept her promise. Megan met me under the apple tree that night. <laughs> She came straight toward me and into my arms, and our lips sought each other, and we stood there together for a long time in the moonlight. Megan, Megan, why did you come? Sir, you asked me to. Megan, darling, don't call me sir. What should I be calling you? Frank. Oh, I couldn't. But you love me, don't you? I couldn't help loving you, and I want to be with you. That's all. That's all? I shall die if I can't be with you. You shall be with me forever, Megan, forever. We'll go to London. I'll show you the world. I don't care where you go. If I can be with you, that's all. Tomorrow, dear, I'll, I'll go to Torquay and get some money and get you some clothes that won't be noticed. And when we get to London, if you love me well enough, we'll be married. Oh, oh, no, I couldn't. I only want to be with you. Oh, Megan, I'm not nearly good enough for you. Tell me, when did you begin to love me? When I saw you in the room me. But I never thought you'd want me. <sighs> my darling, my darling. Oh, look, look, the boggle. The boggle? Where? I don't see anything. There, sitting on the stone under the tree. Megan, there's nothing there, only the moonlight on the rocks. I saw it. I'm afraid. Bad sign. A bad sign? I must go. Darling, Megan, there's nothing there. There's no boggle. It's only your imagination. You don't see boggles, but I see them. I know. Good night. M Megan! Megan! I heard the gate click. Knew she'd gone. Instead of her, only this old apple tree in the centre of the woods. A little part of her. And above me and around the blossoms, more living, more moonlit than ever, seemed to glow and breathe. The next morning I left early and went to Torquay. I wanted to get some money and I had to cash a cheque. But I found that, without credentials, I'd have to wait till they wired the London Bank for verification. While I waited for the answer, I shopped for a dress for Megan. Here's something, sir. It's very smart. The more I looked at those modish gowns, the less they seemed suited to Megan. It was incredible that Megan, my Megan, could ever be dressed in anything except the rough tweed skirt and battered tam o shanter I'd always seen her wear. Couldn't make up my mind, and yet she couldn't wear her old clothes in London. They wouldn't suit her either. Couldn't make up my mind. 
I walked the streets of Torquay, confused and undecided. Well, Frank Ashurst. Haven't seen you since rugby. Huh? Oh, Halliday! Bill Halliday! This is a surprise! Hey, if you're not lunching anyway, come with me. I'm here with my sister Stella. Oh, that's good. I I'd love to see Stella and I haven't any good reason for refusing, Phil. Oh, great Scott, I've completely forgotten the time. It's after three and the bank's closed. Splendid. That means you'll have to stay over in Torquay. Oh, I, I can't do that. But well, we should love to have you. I know Phil's getting bored to death with me and we'd have such fun. Yes, it has been fun, Stella. I've been rustic for so long I'd almost forgotten how pleasant London talk can be. Very well. <laughs> I'll stay. I sent a wire to Mrs. Narcombe. I hoped that Megan would understand. Just this one day away from her wouldn't matter. This was the life that I'd always known. Gay, cheerful, normal people. Just a few more hours of the life before I left it altogether didn't seem wrong. Stella was a pretty thing. Curious, the calm way she looked at me, as if she understood everything and never questioned too deeply. But that night I couldn't sleep. I thought of Megan. I was with her again, under the living, breathing whiteness of the blossoms, the moonlight on her upturned face, the face of innocence and humble passion. Megan, poor little trusting Megan, how much did I really love her? How much was madness, and the spring, and the wild beauty of her? I thought of Stella. Stella, cool, poised, and friendly. Stella belonged to the world I knew and understood, a world that understood me. Megan. Megan didn't understand, and she never could belong. She loved me, but was that enough for either of us? I didn't know what to do. Phil and Stella had asked me to go with them to Torkness for a picnic. I hadn't given them a definite answer, nor did I send any further wire to Mrs. Narcombe. Today I had to decide. I knew that. I went out for a walk along the cliff wall. There was a high sea running. There weren't many people out. I'd walked a mile or so, I guess, before I saw her. There she was, Megan, in her old skirt and jacket and tam o' shanter. She was looking for me. I knew that at once. She'd looked up into the face of the, of the passers-by, wavering, lost-looking, and somehow pitiful. I followed her a long way. Once she stopped and leaned against the sea wall, I wanted her again. I wanted her kisses, her abandonment. All her qu quick, warm, pagan emotion, and the wonderful feeling that night under the moonlit apple tree. Yet I, I couldn't move toward her. I couldn't let her know I was there. For suddenly I realized that to go back to the farm and love Megan, out in the woods, among the rocks, with everything around, wild and fitting, that was what I wanted. And that was impossible. But to transplant her to the town, to keep her in some little flat, and when the wild ecstasy wore off to find her commonplace, unable to fit into my world, and no longer able to go back to her own, that was worse, far worse. I took another long, last look at that pathetic, wistful figure, staring out over the sea. Goodbye, Megan. Goodbye, my darling. Goodbye. Three days later, I went back to London, travelling with the Hallidays. On the last day of April the following year, Stella and I were married. All this I remembered as I sat there on the hill in the warm sun, and as I remembered an ache for a lost youth, a hankering and a sense of wasted love and sweetness gripped me, and the sun no longer warm, I got up and walked a ways down the road. 
There was a man standing by. What I saw was a grave. An old man he was, and the grave was by the crossroads. There was a moor stone to the west, and on it someone had thrown a blackthorn spray and a handful of bluebells. Good afternoon to you, sir. Nice day for the walk. Um, can you tell me whose grave this is? Well, now, it's quite a story. Twas a poor soul that killed herself. Twas a long time ago. She was a pretty girl, but too loving-hearted. Too, too loving-hearted? In them days, I was working for Mrs. Narcombe, and she was too. There was a college gentleman staying with us. She took a fancy to him. He was a nice fellow, too. Then one day he went away some Mike and never came back. After that she was crying a lot, and then one day I found her. She was lying in the pool by the old apple tree, by the stone where the boggle sat. Oh. It was June then, but she'd found a little bit of apple blossom and stuck it in her hair. I walked away. I had heard enough. On the top of the hill, I lay down and buried my face in my hands. Megan's face brushed close. Megan, with a sprig of apple blossoms and a dark, wet hair. If I can be with you, that's all. If I can be with you. Oh, there you are, Frank. Look at my sketch. It's pretty, don't you think? Hmm? Uh, oh, yes, it's very pretty. Still, there's something wanting, isn't there? Yes. Yes, there was something wanting. The apple tree. The singing and the gold. You have just heard the Orson Welles Mercury production of The Apple Tree by John Galsworthy. Before we go, a word from Mr. Wells. Ladies and gentlemen, because we have a couple of minutes before it's time to say goodnight, I'd like to read to you a poem. It's by Charles Lutwidge Dodgson, whom you might better know as Lewis Carroll, a great favorite of mine. It's called Jabberwocky. Was brillig, and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wave. All mimsy were the burrogroves, and the momeraths outgrave. Beware the jabberwock, my son, the jaws that bite, the claws that catch. Beware the jubjub bird, and shun the frumrious bandersnatch. He took his vorpal sword in hand long time. The manxome foe he sought, so rested he by the tum tum tree and stood a while in thought. And as in uffish thought he stood, the jabberwock with eyes of flame came whistling through the tulgy wood and burbled as it came. One, two, one, two, and through and through the vorpal blade went snicker snack. He left it dead, and with its head he went galumphing back. And hast thou slain the Jabberwock? Come to my arms, my beamish boy. O oh, frabjous day, Kalu kale! He chortled in his joy. T'was brillig, and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wave. All mimsy were the burrogroves, and the momorath out grey. And now it's time to say good night. Till then, we remain, as always, obediently yours. Thank you, Orson. Now, let me again remind you to be patient with your dealer when occasionally these days he's unable to supply you with all the A&W root beer you'd like. He's doing his best, you could be sure of that. Yes, and here's something else you could be sure of. Every single bottle of A&W root beer you do get will, as always, be the happy blending of never less than 33 fine brews. Yes, 
every foaming frosty glass you enjoy will, as always, have that famous A&W root beer flavor. Not too heavy, not too light, but fresh, clean, sparkling, with the real root beer taste coming through the way you like it. So keep asking for blended, splendid A&W root beer. Such a lovely story, and gotta love those vintage root beer ads. We have reached our final radio play of the evening, ladies and gentlemen. Please be sure to give your love and appreciation in the chat, and don't forget if you liked what you've heard this evening, we have two more live streams uh, tomorrow and Saturday. Uh, Our final radio play of the evening is The Tom Keeler Murders from the radio show Broadway is My Beat. It originally aired August 22nd, 1951. And yet again, don't forget to give those amazing performers some love in the chat. Check out our virtual program and make your donation to support the arts. All links are in the description below. Enjoy the show. Broadway is my beat. From Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, and the lonesomest smile in the world. Broadway's My Beat with Paul Campbell as Detective Danny Glover. In autumn sunlight, the September day trots out its promises for Broadway's consideration, displays them in doorways, in push carts, in gutters, decorates them with price tags, invites you to browse, don't touch, buy, don't squeeze, and at cut rates of secondhand delights, the prices Slash down to any man's purse, the bold end of dreams. The vendors simper, the hawkers wink. Bye, kid. That's a winter sun on your shoulder, and the day is short. So bye. And that's what you do, kid. Because on Broadway, there's no other choice. And at police headquarters, the September's day has arranged its wares of violence on your desk, stacked as the category, degree, grade, because the day is still fresh. You put off the reaching for them, the touching of them, but it screams close to your ear. In the morgue, Danny. Calm down. I've got something of interest to you. And you walk down the corridor to the room of the dead. Through the swinging doors into a place without season, where all nights, all days are of equal length, where temperature is constant, where the wind is conditioned before it's let flow over death. Walk up to the man who waits for you. A nervous twitch, Danny, to juggle things in my right hand. Maybe I'll be remembered for it. And what have we got here, Dr. Fine? The man lying there. They found him in his bed last night. Murdered. These that murdered him. Two bullets. Look. Yeah, a twenty-two and a thirty-two. Wouldn't you say so, Doctor? That I wouldn't know. What is known is only one of these was needed to kill him. Either one. The man was wanted dead twice, Danny. He was killed twice. Two bullets, different size, twice dead. You know who he was? When they brought him to me last night, there was a tag on him. A name. Tom Keeler. An address, the Nixon Hotel. Nothing else. No other words to the living about why such things had to happen. You're sure, Doctor? Yeah. You sure that the... Each wound was a mortal wound, Danny. Each wound could... Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. You want these, huh? Yeah. Take them. 
And that's the way my day began. And the ingredients of it were a medical examiner, a murdered man, and two bullets in a room of no value except to the dead, except to those whose business is with death. Consider that briefly and then push it away. Leave go, get out, and hurry. And in the corridor, find what you're looking for, the breath of air not controlled by a thermostat, and then to walk down the hall, turn over the bullets to technical, then inside the squad car and the ride to West 35th Street, and to the Nixon Hotel. Up to the five-story brownstone that seemed to list from the pressure of the insurance housing project next door to it. Go on in and ring the bell. And wait. And be greeted by a man in gray suspenders and no shirt. Morning. Morning. I'm Danny Clover. Please. Randy Quantrio, ha. Huh? Had a little trouble here last night, didn't you? Oh, just a mess of it. Oh, you know the man who was killed? You mean Tom, huh? Yeah, that's right, Tom Keeler. What do you mean, know him? Well, talk to him. Have a beer with him. Said hi to him. That's about the extent of my to-do with him. How about visitors? Do you have any? Look at the sign over my shoulder, Mr. Clover. Mr. Clover... I know some clovers down in Selma, Alabama. You any kin to any clovers? No, no, no. Oh, look at the sign over my shoulder. N-O visitors, no visitors. And you think that just because the sign is there, Tom Keeler didn't have any visitors? Oh, no, I don't, mister. We got a sign in each and every room that says no smoking in bed. And in the last year, we had three mattress fires. So what I'm saying is, I never seen anybody sneak past this desk that I say to myself, there's a Tom Keeler visitor. And what else about Keeler? Oh, we got mail this morning. Maybe I ought to tell you that. Yeah, maybe you should. I'm going to. Fresh mail that come this morning. Here, the letter. Okay, thanks. From the Great Northern National Bank. So I see. Please come in and talk to us with regards to your commercial account at your earliest convenience. Oh, so you read upside down, Mr. Quantrio. I've lived in Baltimore. Oh, well, thank you, Mr. Quantrio. Thanks a lot. And for that, Randy Quantrio winked at me, laughed noiselessly at me, leaned against the mail rack and scratched his back with it. I wasn't in the moment to intrude any longer on such private pleasures, so I left him. And at the Great Northern National Bank, a guard, uniformed in tattletale gray, took my name, my business, walked down the marble aisle with them, and I'll lined with identical desks, identical faces behind them. Unerringly, the guard chose one, the right one. He was a shrewd guard. He mooted his voice to the extracurricular business I had brought to the Great Northern, offered it to the man. The man considered it, digested it, and when he had it all in order, motioned me to the chair the guard had placed discreetly close to him. How can we help you, Mr. Clover? A man named Tom Keeler had a checking account here. We're aware of it, therefore. Then you know he was murdered last night in the chief hotel. We're aware of many things, Mr. Clover. Our research... I'm sorry, I can't hear you. What'd you say? I said that our research department makes a point of informing each of us of any diverse matters, matters that even could remote, just remotely concern us. Thank you. Beg your pardon? I said thank you, because 
You let me hear what you had to say. Hmm. I was appointed, Mr. Clover. Should any questions arise about the late Tom Keeler, should any questions arise, I would so answer the question. Your interrogation is what, Mr. Clover? We down at headquarters think it's strange that Tom Keeler slept in a flop house when he had, uh... Check an account with us? Uh-huh. Philosophical question, Mr. Clover. Somewhat out of our province. Pardon me? What? <clears throat> I say that all we know of Thomas Kidler is that we were asked to transfer $50 weekly into his account, which we have done religiously until... Who told you to do that? Counselor at Law, George Weber. You want his address? We should give it to you. Thanks. You were saying you did this until... until what? Till two weeks ago. Possibly two weeks and a fraction of a day. Mr. Weber, Mr. Weber asked us to discontinue his generosity. Why? I suggest that's a personal matter concerning Mr. Weber. Why trouble him with it? What? What? I, I'm sorry, I... I said that I... No, never mind. Probably wasn't important. And go to the Park Avenue apartments of George Weber, be told by the person at the desk that Mr. Weber is not at home, perhaps his office, the person suggested. Then he handed me a slip of paper with the office address in handwriting with Eyes dotted with small circles. Weber and Marley, the slip said. Attorneys, finance building, suite 12. Go there. And through a door, past the beam of an electric eye, wade through the carpet to a desk and an olive-skinned girl with tight black hair. Offer your name... Show your credentials. Be told Mr. Weber is out. Would you see his partner, Mr. Marley? You would. You nodded past another door. And another beam. And to a slender young man who is waiting in front of a wall lined with every law book ever written. Be chaperoned by him through yet another door. And there he was, Paul Marley, partner to George Weber, impeccable in morning coat, striped pants, and an army discharge button in his lapel. That'll be all, Robertson. Now, sit down, please, Mr... Uh, Clover. Clover, please sit down. Thank you. The information you gave out there says you're a policeman. That's right. And this is about what, sir? What can I do for you? It's about a man named Tom Keeler. Keeler, Keeler. A man found murdered last night. Yes. Shot twice with different caliber bullets, either one fatal. Yes. Is this a matter of legal advice for the police department? You want to know if a man was shot by two people and each? No, that's not it at all. Tom Keeler, it seems, was supported by your partner. By Mr. Weber? That's right. Each week, $50 was drawn on Mr. Weber's account and deposited in favor of Tom Keeler. Uh, surely. Oh, there's no mistake. That is the way it was. But I know Mr. Weber so well. His affairs, everything. And where is he? On Fire Island since the day before yesterday. He, was a, he has a place there. I'm pretty sure he went there. A little out of season for Fire Island, isn't it? Oh, I don't think so. End of September? Mr. Weber goes there all year round. Whenever. Whenever what? Whenever he's disturbed. He has the idea of the sea, the strand, the loneliness of it. Personally, I don't know. Uh, what was Mr. Weber disturbed about? Oh, he has a sister, Peggy. She's just 20, so you can imagine. No, I can't. Beautiful girl of 20, rich, and you can't imagine? Look, Mr. Marley. My partner was constantly arguing with her. We're a conservative firm, Mr. Clover. Individually, both Mr. Weber and myself. And what's all that got to do with Peggy? Peggy Weber is headstrong. How? I take my partner's word for it that she's headstrong. Therefore... And they argued. Peggy and her brother. What about? I have no idea. 
And he went to Fire Island to recuperate. One way of saying it. Anything else, Mr. Clover? No. Then please, these documents here, if you wouldn't mind. And get in touch with the authorities at Fire Island on the whereabouts of Mr. George Weber. And wait. And an hour later, a phone call. Mr. Weber is not on Fire Island. Mr. Weber's place is deserted. From the looks of it, hasn't been inhabited in over a month. So, come up with a conclusion. Mr. George Weber was missing. Put out an all-points bulletin on him and go back to the Park Avenue apartments and make a request of the management. We're always glad to accommodate the uh, police. Then let's go, shall we? Of course. Mr. Weber's apartment right this way, down the hall. Although I, I would know, I would like to know why we should intrude. Oh, well, don't worry about it. Yes, sir. Open the door. Of course. And here we are. Yeah, we are, aren't we? What do you say? What do you say? What do you say, Mr. Clover? I did. Oh. It stopped both of us the management and myself, it was a sight that only needed one glance and the details were there forever. The free-shaped coffee table and the grotesquery of the man spread beside it, the tracery of blood that stopped abruptly. Mr. Weber, that's Mr. Weber. The penknife, bone handled and cheap in his heart to be remembered. Details in the death of George Weber. You're listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Franken, and starring Paul Campbell as David Danny Clover. There'll be a slight pause as we think an adjective to describe Maria Lanza. Sorry, guess there just isn't one ad adjective to describe a guy who sings just as well in popular range as in the classics. But here's a suggestion. On the CBS radio tomorrow night over most of these same station, don't miss Mario Lanza's All Request Show and more by the same by lovely Giselle McKenzie and Ray Sintra's music. And when the night slips out of Broadway's fingers and the false dawn blurs the shadows, Broadway stands bewildered. The carnival is run down. Only the stragglers walk it with their step without pattern, like their dreams. And the color of their loneliness is the darkened neon, the last glow of a cigarette butt and pavement gray, and they walk it. They never know Broadway's closed for the night. And somehow or another, whether it deserves it or not, the world gets to be nine o'clock in the morning. And there's a place for everybody. It's daytime, breakfast time, work time, make a dollar time. Or, as Sergeant Gino Tartaglia said it, Lend me a dollar, Denny. Oh, sure, Gino. Here. Thank you. The reason for this transaction, Denny, is... No, you don't have to explain it. I want to, I want to. <sighs> All right, go ahead. Thank you. Miss Tartaglia forgot to tuck my dollar into my lunchbox today, as is her wont. But the little things a man during the day... She just phoned me and confessed her dereliction of duty in this matter. Gino. She said to ask Danny for it, and tomorrow she will tuck in two dollars so that you will not go hungry. Tell Mrs. T not to worry about it. Roger will go. And now, Danny, to the chores of the day. 
Knife which did George Weber in was of the variety which can be purchased at our leading hardware stores for the nominal sum of one dollar and ninety-eight cents. Practically untraceable. Prince wiped clean. Go on. Well, that's about the sum and substance of the intelligence which has been shunted from the downstairs to the here, Danny. As of now, however... Yeah. A young lady is in the ante room and wants to see you. Who is she? A Miss Peggy Weber, sister of the most latterly deceased. I get her. This way to see Danny Clover. Uh, sit down, Miss Weber. That'll be all, Gino. Glad you came, Miss Weber. Your name's right here on my calendar to see today. I knew you want to question me about George. And how did you hear about his death? I was home, the late news on the radio. You see, I didn't live with my brother. We didn't get along. Oh? Gonna be a lot simpler with him gone. I wear a black dress like this one for a month and call it a decent interview of morning. You know, it's not any concern of mine, Miss Weber, but, um... Oh, it's entirely of your concern, Mr. Clover. Your position demands that you locate people who would have motives for murdering my brother. I would. So did you kill him? A few of my friends and I got together some time ago for kicks. We were, go we were trying, trying things together, you know, just for kicks, black magic. Well, I went to, I spent the first days of my membership sticking pins in my brother's picture. And all that happens is that he got a star in his eye. Outside of that, I've never harmed a hair on his head. Why all this hate, Miss Weber? Simple this. I loved a boy. Told George about him. George got red, then blue, red again. Then a lovely color I'd never seen before. He found out who that boy was. Ruined him. And who is this boy? Ralph Clay. Now runs a bowling alley on third. Uh, one more thing. You, you know a fellow named Tom Keeler? Not offhand. Why? Oh, never mind. Something to do with... Ah, leave your address with Sergeant Italia, Miss Weber. And thank you very much. You Ralph Clay? Huh? Oh, hello. Yeah, that's me. Till my dying day. You walked in on an empty hall, mister. Feel real sorry about it. Oh, don't be. This way we can have a nice long talk. Shall we? Wait a minute. I want to take care of this thing coming up. Kingpin, seven pin, challenge. What do you think? Go ahead. Watch me. Yeah, yeah, never say go ahead to me in that tone, mister. Not on that shop. My quirk each day. I live for it. Something Peggy Weber said. Sent me to you. Peggy, the girl in class. She thought you had killed her brother. I got the impression she was in love with you. Pity, the girl. She lives in ancient history at a time where she loved and I loved back. But ancient history, under the bridge. Peggy did something to you? She had a brother. Now... Now, now, did I read? It stopped me for a breath on the way to the sports page. George Weber did something to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm a man who likes to talk about it. My daily nourishment. Share it with me? Sure. Georgie Porgy Weber didn't like how his sister pre used to put a hand in mine, so he mocked me lousy. How? Standing before you, Mr. Police, as a boy who once thought he was a lawyer. Cap in hand. He went to Georgie, his soon-to-be brother-in-law, and asked for a job. Keep it in the family. Georgie smiled, shook his head no, and with words and music, he told me he'd spoil me from any job I took from anyone he knew. Because you loved his sister? I was second in my class in law school. You want to invent another reason? Well, I hate Peggy for it. Things like that run in the blood. I don't stick around till it comes out in Peggy and slaps me in the head. Then that gives you a motive for having killed Weber. Ain't that a lucky one. And Tom Keeler. What do you have for him? Keeler? Yeah, the man who got killed in a flea bag. Man Weber supported. Why, why is he called Uncle? 
Peggy calls him uncle because he was a confessor, a hero. Everything that ate Peggy, she brought to good old Uncle Tom. And not to her brother? Who goes to a man like that except to kill him? I give you something to ponder, Mr. Police? Yeah, you did. I'm glad. Makes me want to live through another day. Eh. Watch that bitter boy make his strike. Yeah, yeah. And consider the lie he'd flip to you. The girls lie that she didn't know Tom Keeler and wonder over it. Jot it down in memory as a future conversation piece with Peggy Weber, and then remember a man who said he knew all about George Weber, everything. Everything but the mention of Keeler's share in his partner's life. Go to him. Wait for him to finish his Got this little time machine for being on my toes, Mr. Clover. Handsome tidbit, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Seventeen jewels, Hamilton. All because I proved in court that cha the chap's wife had been unfriendly to said chap. Look at Marley for sending me free. The chum. And what was there about Tom Keeler that shut your mouth about him? My... My, my compliments, Mr. Clover. Brilliant strategy. Attack while the enemy celebrates minor victories. In tactics class at Fort Meade, we... You told me about Weber. Personal things about him. His sister. Why not about Tom Keeler? It pained me. For George's sake, my deceased partner's sake. It pained me. You'll show me where it hurts. You think you'll be able to understand? Don't answer. Doesn't matter. Keeler was a derelict. A bum. A hungry shadow in George's closet. That's why George opened that account for him. To keep him from coming here to beg. George and I had a large investment here. The presence of Keeler. At my assistance, my counsel made quite the row the other day between Tom and George. I had to shoo people back to their desks. Did you kill George Weber? Attack, attack. I admire your method, Mr. Clover. Secretary, junior partner. All yours now. You kill Weber for that? The death of my partner was a great loss for me, Mr. Clover. A personal loss. Were it in my humble power to hunt down his assassins, I would dedicate my knowledge, my life, my... Yes, uh, Danny. I got a case. I'd like you to check it out for me. Gladly. Get out the medical examiner's report on Tom Keeley. Uh, here. What do you want it for? I want to put it side by side with this one. I got on George Weber. So... And what does it say? It says, uh, Weber died day before yesterday at approximately 6 p.m. Uh-huh. And it says on this report that Keeler died about midnight of the same day. You know what that means, Doctor? No. What? There's a pencil on your desk. Figure it out. Well, Mr. Clover, use my address after all. Mind if I come in, Miss Weber? This evening you can go as far as calling me Peggy, but you can't come in. I'm afraid I'll have to. You'll have to force your way in? <laughs> I could relish in that. Peggy. Well, a friend's visiting me. Ralph Clay. You said the password. If you know that, you might as well come in. Ralph, Ralph, come out wherever you are. 
Say hello to Mr. Clover, Ralph. You want to ask Peggy questions? Yeah, you too. Goody, goody. You lied to me too, Peggy. Because I'm a liar. Get Ralph a lot of trouble that way. Don't I, Ralph? Let's just listen to what the man has to say. You lie about Keeler, Peggy. You said you didn't know who he was. I explained it to you. I'm a liar. And I found out who killed your brother, Peggy. I said we I... We heard you. And there were a lot of motives floating around, Peggy. Yours... Leave her alone. She didn't kill a brother. I did. Oh, cut it out, Ralph. Peggy. Ralph had nothing to do with it. I did it. What's the matter with you, Peggy? You're crazy. You're a liar. You lie. That's why you're saying you killed your brother. Well, well, please. Neither one of you killed him. You thought that Ralph did, Peggy. And Ralph... What are you trying to do to us, Clover? What are you doing? Police methods trying to get us to play against each other? Oh, take it easy, Ralph. Go on, take it easy, Ralph. Take it easy, Ralph. What are you trying to say? Talk, talk, talk. Tom Keeler killed Peggy's brother. What? Clover, so help me all. Oh, listen to me, both of you. Clover. Let him talk, Ralph. Keeler killed him because his source of income was cut off. A man like Keeler, he could kill. A desperate man, a man who loved livelihood, a tramp. Made a habit off of living off of someone else's generosity. Well, well, it's all my fault. And you found your brother dead, didn't you, Peggy? Yes, and I... You thought Ralph did it. Yes, I thought... <laughs> Ralph! It's gonna be all right, baby. And Peggy went to her Uncle Tom, like she always did when she was in trouble, told him Ralph had killed her brother, and what? did Tom Keeler say to you, Peggy? He said, just not to worry, just not to worry. And then he got in touch with you, huh, Ralph? Yeah, yeah, he did. You know what he told me? Yeah, I think so. He told me Peggy killed a brother. He was the killer all the time, and I'm supposed to be a bright boy. So, he had each of you believing that the other had killed George Weber. How much money did he want from each of you to protect the other? Oh, what difference does it make? It doesn't matter anymore. Blackmail. That's why Tom Teeler's dead, too. Murdered. Yeah, you'll slap the cuffs on me for that one, Clover. My uncle said he wanted everything. I had to keep quiet about Ralph, so I, so I went to his hotel room when he was sleeping, and I, I shot him. No, 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 Peggy, that's what I did. That's what you both did, to protect the other. You both shot Tom Keeler. <laughs> hey, 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 Peggy. <laughs> oh, stop it. Stop it. <laughs> Peggy. Oh, Peggy. <laughs> There's a time on Broadway when the crowd gives up and goes home. The lights buzz fitfully and die. Then it's a street of dim moonlight and dark whispers and the wind of the autumn night, the wind that scatters everything, yesterday's headlines, yesterday's dreams, yesterday's people, Broadway, the gaudiest, most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world, Broadway. My be. Thank you all so much for listening in tonight. Give these amazing humans another huge round of applause in the chat. 
so incredibly proud. Oh my goodness, that was great. Uh, remember that your donations are how we keep doing our work. Support this program by donating any amount via donation ticket at ecrvada.booktix.com. All the links are available in the description below, including our virtual program. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. They did such a good job. If you enjoyed what you heard tonight, ladies and gents, tell your friends. We have two more live streamed performances tomorrow night and Saturday night. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much, guys. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank <laughs> you.